As our tale begins, a man wakes from slumber by a familiar calling voice somewhere in the distance. Satan! 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 Wrapping himself in a robe and following the repeated cries for help, the man cautiously makes his way downstairs where he finds himself in the presence of a funerary service, beckoned by a pallbearer to raise the lid of the casket. The man recoils in fright when he sees the occupant of the coffin is none other than himself. Fleeing to the safety of his bedroom, he bolts the door behind him, but is terrified when the voice of the dead man calls to him once again, this time from his own bed. Satan, Satan. He turns, shocked, to see himself staring back at him. It was simply a nightmare, but its true meaning is unknown to all but the resident patient. In his book, a study in celluloid, Michael Cox shared his thoughts on the first act of this episode. He wrote, As all Holmes scholars know, Conan Doyle added a section to this story when it was first published in book form in The Memoirs of 1894. He had decided not to include the cardboard box in that collection but was reluctant to lose the impressive mind-reading trick about General Gordon and Henry Ward Beecher, which originally appeared in that story. So he transposed it to the resident patient, which goes to show what importance he attached to these exercises in domestic deduction. They were, of course, a continual challenge to Watson, who was regularly dazzled by his friend's skill and must have longed to turn the tables. Conan Doyle certainly realized this, and when he was asked to contribute a Sherlockian fragment to the library of the Queen's Dolls House in 1922, he chose to describe how Watson learned the trick. It is an amusing piece in which Watson attempts to apply Holmes's methods and reaches a completely erroneous conclusion. So let's take just a moment to hear How Watson Learned the Trick by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Watson had been watching his companion intently ever since he sat down to the breakfast table. Holmes happened to look up and catch his eye. Well, Watson, what are you thinking about? He asked. About you? Me? Yes, Holmes. I was thinking how superficial are these tricks of yours, and how wonderful it is that the public should continue to show interest in them. I quite agree, said Holmes. In fact, I have a recollection that I myself have made a similar remark. Your methods, said Watson severely, are really easily acquired. No doubt, Holmes answered with a smile. Perhaps you will yourself give an example of this method of reasoning. With pleasure, said Watson. I am able to say that you were greatly preoccupied when you got up this morning. Excellent, said Holmes. How could you possibly know that? Because you are usually a very tidy man, and yet you have forgotten to shave. Dear me, how very clever, said Holmes. I had no idea, Watson, that you were so apt a pupil. Has your eagle eye detected anything more? Yes, Holmes. You have a client named Barlow, and you have not been successful with his case. Dear me, how could you know that? I saw the name outside his envelope. When you opened it, you gave a groan and thrust it into your pocket with a frown on your face. Admirable, you are indeed observant. Any other points? I fear, Holmes, that you have taken to financial speculation. How could you tell that, Watson? You opened the paper, turned to the financial page, and gave a loud exclamation of interest. Well, that is very clever of you, Watson. Any more? Yes, Holmes. You have put on your black coat instead of your dressing gown, 
which proves that you're expecting some important visitor at once. Anything more? I have no doubt that I could find other points, Holmes, but I only give you these few in order to show you that there are other people in the world who can be as clever as you. And some not so clever, said Holmes. I admit that they are few, but I am afraid, my dear Watson, that I must count you among them. What do you mean, Holmes? Well, my dear fellow, I fear your deductions have not been so happy as I would have wished. You mean that I was mistaken? Just a little that way, I fear. Let us take your points in their order. I did not shave because I sent my razor to be sharpened. I put on my coat because I have, worse luck, an early meeting with my dentist. His name is Barlow, and the letter was to confirm the appointment. The cricket page is beside the financial one, and I turned to it to find if Surrey was holding its own against Kent. But go on, Watson, go on. It's a very superficial trick, and no doubt you will soon acquire it. In his book, Michael Cox continued. Jeremy Brett and David Burke were eager to include just such an exercise in one of the later adventures, and we chose to do it in this film as a change from the more familiar deduction. I had to rule out Conan Doyle's own version of Watson's attempt because it was not in the public domain. Instead, we asked our writer to invent his own and to set it in the barbershop on Baker Street, which we had built as an alternative setting to the hard-worked sitting room. He came up with a sequence that revolves around Holmes grinding his teeth and drumming his fingers on the arm of his chair. You mustn't take it so badly, Holmes. What? Well, I know it's inconvenient, but you really mustn't let it affect you like this. But whatever do you mean? You are sitting there, boiling with indignation because you have been forced to leave the warmth and comfort of 221B by the ardor of Mrs. Hudson's spring cleaning. Oh, my dear Watson, how ever did you deduce that? By simply applying your methods, Holmes. Indeed. You'll agree that you are not here for either a shave or a haircut. That is true. How did you know? Because you invariably shave yourself. And you are patently not due for a haircut for another two weeks. Correct. And you left our rooms in some haste. You are without either your gloves or your cane. Go on. Well, I know that Mrs. Hudson has been trying to complete her spring cleaning all day. Now, you have been sitting there, frowning, eyes tightly closed, grinding your teeth, and all the time your fingers have been drumming like pistons on the arm of that chair. So, given all this evidence, even I cannot fail to deduce that you have quarreled with our good housekeeper and sought refuge in the sanity of the barber's shop. <laughs> uh, you cannot deny that I am right. Ah, oh, Watson, you could not be further from the truth. I am here to get our good barber's advice as to this specimen of hair found at the scene of the bloody misadventure last Tuesday in Deptford. Oh, come along, Holmes. You're worried about something. What you perceived as agitation was indeed the most intense and tranquil enjoyment. My eyes were closed because I was trying to recall as vividly as I could the concert that we attended last night. You were grinding your teeth. That is because I made a slight error in my recollection of Joachim's fingering in his cadenza. In the third movement of the Beethoven Violin Concerto, Papa, da, da, papa. Nevertheless, there is an element of truth in what you say. Ah! <laughs> in 
Granada's Greatest Detective, author Keith Frankel sings the praises of Brett's performance here. He writes, Here, every internal tremor dapples his features with almost fathomless complexity and exactitude. Even more remarkable is the inspired lyricism of his reading, how the sweet, velvety croon of tranquility can be staggered by the sour, rat-a-tat-tat rasp of vexation. Dialogue that could be so easily prosaic, Brett either cajoles or compels until every word burnishes with meaning, texture, and substance. Particularly arresting are the eyes, which dilate dreamily when reliving the previous evening's concert, and then corkscrew with stone-cold contempt at the audacity of a misremembered meter or cadence. Lest we forget that for the logician, whether it be deduction or art or music, even the most imperceptible error can only ever be of detriment to the work itself. The almost breathless reverence with which Holmes utters Joachim's name underscores his absolute veneration for the man. From start to finish, this vignette is an unvarnished joy, forming arguably the high point of the entire adaptation. Their business at the barbershop concluded, Holmes and Watson stroll back to 221B, arm in arm, where they quickly notice a cab parked outside their doorway. A doctor. A general practitioner, as I perceive. Not been long in practice or had much to do. Come to consult us, I fancy. Lucky we came back. <laughs> Of this sweeping sequence, Keith Frankel observed, The resident patient displays a stroke of glorious cinematic enterprise, the feeling of absolute weightlessness director David Carson achieves in transporting us from street level to the interior of 221B. In and of itself, it's the kind of stylistic foray that lends a certain flair to proceedings. But when augmented by the actual quotation from Beethoven's Violin Concerto, it takes on an undeniable grandeur. For the viewer, there is the literal sense of being swept up by the whirling contours of that buoyantly celestial refrain and gently deposited outside the detective's window where Mrs. Hudson releases the blind, granting us free passage inside. Signing off these high stylings are swishing signatures of regal pomp and panache by the full orchestral ensemble. Impeccably constructed and reeking of sheer class, this may well be the most poetically polished 30 seconds in the whole of the Granada Saga. Inside, Holmes and Watson are met by a pensive doctor by the name of Percy Trevelyan. The doctor has come seeking advice on a disturbing train of events which have come to pass at his house at 403 Brook Street. Beginning with his background, Trevelyan explains that while a competent doctor, a lack of general funding had nearly forced him to abandon his medical ambitions altogether until the occurrence of an unexpected incident. One morning, two years ago, I received a visit from a man by the name of Blessington, who until that time had been a complete stranger to me. Come in. Good heavens, do you live here, in this? Yes, I'm afraid I do. You are the same Percy Trevelyan, who's had so distinguished a career, recently won the Slater Award for Medicine. I am. 
Then answer me frankly, sir, and you'll find it in your interest to do so. Despite your present financial situation, you clearly have all the cleverness that makes a successful man. But have you the tact? I trust that I have my share, sir. Any bad habits? Not drawn toward drink? Now, really, sir. Quite right. Quite right. But I was bound to ask. Why? Why, sir? Simply, why, with all these qualities, are you not in practice? Come now, it's the old story. More in the brains than in the pocket, eh? Now, sir, what would you say, sir, if I were to start you in Brock Street? If a specialist is to succeed, he must aim high, and a practice in Brook Street is just the beginning. Capital, keep yourself in style. To hire a respectable carriage and horse. A surgery that's worthy of you. Waiting room, servants, and the best equipment that money can buy. That is what you will have, sir. But why? It's just like any other investment. Safer than most. And what am I to do? I'll tell you. I will take the house, furnish it, pay the maids, and run the whole place. All you have to do is to wear out the chair in your consulting room. And then you hand over to me three quarters of everything you earn and keep one quarter for yourself. Now, what do you say to that, sir? Do you agree? Trevelyan accepted the terms, and by the next quarter day, he opened his new practice in Brook Street, with his benefactor coming to live with him in the character of a resident patient. Blessington demanded constant medical monitoring, and except for a daily walk, has shunned all outside company, rarely leaving his residence in the ensuing two years. Some weeks ago, Mr. Blessington came down to me in, as it seemed to me, a considerable state of Dr. agitation. Dr. Trevelyan! Dr. Trevelyan! Dr. Trevelyan, sir! Mr. Blessington, calm yourself, sir. Calm myself! Calm myself! But, my dear sir, have you not heard of the burglary? The burglary? Where? No, 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 not here, sir, not here! But it could have been... Within days, Blessington had installed new bars and locks on all the windows and doors. The fear not of burglary, but of death in his eyes. Gradually, as time passed, his fears appeared to die away, and he renewed his former habits. Good evening, Dr. Trevelyan. Wonderful evening outside. I'm beginning to enjoy my walks again. And then suddenly, a fresh event reduced him to the pitiable state of prostration in which he now lies. What happened was, yesterday I received this letter from a Russian nobleman now resident in England who suffers from catalepsy. In it, he announces his intention of visiting me for a consultation this very evening at a quarter past six. Because the chief difficulty in the study of catalepsy is the rareness of the disease, you may believe that at the appointed hour, I was eager to receive the patient. Leaving the son of his patient in the waiting room, Dr. Trevelyan showed the Russian nobleman into his consulting chamber. But after asking just a few preliminary questions, the older gentleman became rigid, completely unable to move. Believing him to be in the midst of a cataleptic fit, Dr. Trevelyan hurried to mix a concoction he believed might relieve the man's symptoms. But upon his return, he found the rooms empty, the two men having vanished. Puzzled, Trevelyan questioned his page, but was interrupted by the shouting of a frantic Mr. Blessington. Doctor! Doctor! Someone has been in my room! No one has been in your room, it's sir. It's a lie! You're lying to me! I assure you I am not. Then come up and see for yourself! Upstairs, Trevelyan is confronted with evidence of an intrusion. Wet footmarks on the carpet 
two sizes too large for the room's occupant. In spite of no apparent burglary, Blessington is reduced to tears, and he makes one final request of his doctor. Did he ask for me by name? Oh, yes. Then let us be on our way. Filmed at Leck Hall near Kirby Lonsdale, Cumbria, tonight's episode guest stars a duo of fantastic performers, the first of which, portraying Dr. Trevelyan, is Mr. Nicholas Clay. Born in Streatham, South London, in 1964, Clay was the son of a sergeant in the Royal Engineers. After a nomadic army childhood, the family finally settled in Kent. And while attending Upbury Manor School, a kindly instructor encouraged Clay to explore the world of theater. Upon seeing Leo McKern in Pear Yint at the Old Vic, Clay made up his mind to pursue the life of a thespian. He quickly became a prominent player in the London theater scene. And in the 1970s, he appeared regularly in the plays of Sir Laurence Olivier's golden Old Vic period. It was during this period that Nicholas Clay struck up a lifelong friendship with actor Clive Marison. He soon began to appear in television and film, with his first major on-screen role being that of psycho handyman Billy Jarvis in the Roald Dahl adaptation of The Night Digger. From there, he played many parts, including Charles Darwin in Jack Cowfer's The Darwin Adventure, where Clay played opposite Ian Richardson. He also appeared in the 1979 adventure film Zulu Dawn, opposite Burt Lancaster, Simon Ward, and Denholm Elliott. But Clay is, perhaps, best remembered for playing Sir Lancelot in John Borman's 1981 classic swashbuckler, Excalibur. Who are you? What do you seek? I am Lancelot of the Lake, from across the sea. And I have yet to find a king worthy of my sword. That is a wild boast. You lack a knight's humility. Not a boast, sir, but a curse. For I have never met my match in joust or duel. Overside! I will not. You must retreat, or prove your worth in the test of arms under the eyes of God. Then may he give me the strength to unhorse you, and send you with one blow back across the sea. Then come across, sir. Of Clay's portrayal of Lancelot, Clive Marison recalled, He wore a lot of armor, but that comes with heroic acting, and Nick did that with epic braggadocio. He could swash a buckle. In the 1990s, Clay would work mostly in television, making appearances on shows like Highlander, Merlin, Zorro, The New Adventures of Robin Hood as Sheriff Nottingham, and The Agatha Christie Hour as Matthew Armitage in A Glass Darkly. And the Granada series was not his only brush with the pen of Conan Doyle. In 1983, he played Jack Stapleton, as well as Sir Hugo Baskerville, in the made-for-television adaptation of The Hound of the Baskervilles, where he acted alongside Granada alum Ronald Lacey, who portrayed Inspector Lestrade. Ian Richardson also appeared as the great detective. But Clay had one other connection to the Granada series worthy of note. In 1976, he appeared in the BBC Play of the Month, The Picture of Dorian Gray. This production starred Peter Firth, John Gielgud, and Jeremy Brett as Basil Howard, Dorian's friend. The production received critical success at the time and is discussed even to this day, recently being called the most Wildean adaptation of the novel by the New York Times. And while Nicholas Clay and Jeremy Brett had no on-screen dialogue together, they did share a rather unique scene, which I won't spoil for the uninitiated. Happily, that production is readily available on YouTube, 
and I do recommend it. In the late 90s, Clay was diagnosed with cancer of the liver. But true to his heroic nature, he faced the illness with enormous bravery, without self-pity or anger. In his final years, Clay taught drama at the Actors' Center and the Academy of Live and Performing Arts, and also worked with the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, providing advice to acting students. Nicholas Clay died on May 25th, 2000, in London, at the age of 53. Later that night, the trio arrive back at the doctor's office on Brook Street, when suddenly the lights go black and our heroes are left frozen in the dark as a manic Mr. Blessington brandishes a revolver from the balcony. Mr. Blessington, this is outrageous, sir. Do you not recognize me? Is that you, Doctor? Yes, of course it is me. The other two gentlemen, are they what they pretend to be? They are Mr. Sherlock Holmes and his friend, Dr. Watson. Good God, Mr. Blessington, it was you that asked me to fetch them. Yes. Yes, yes. Forgive me. Forgive me. Blessington reactivates the electric lights, only to find Sherlock Holmes on his knees, measuring footprints on the carpeted stairs. Holmes retracts his measuring tape and approaches his petitioner with suspicion in his eyes. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure I'm very much obliged to you for coming round. No one has ever needed your advice more than I, no one. I expect Dr. Trevelyan has told you of this unwarrantable intrusion into my rooms. Why, sir, Mr. Blessington, who are these two men? Which two men? I don't know them. Then why do they wish to molest you? Molest me? Well, you can hardly expect me to answer that. You mean that you don't know? Come in here, please. Just have the kindness to step in here. Inside, Blessington explains that his entire life savings is kept there, in the strong box. But Holmes sees this deflection for what it is, and calls Blessington's bluff. Mr. Blessington, I cannot possibly advise you if you try to deceive me. Deceive you? But I've told you everything! Good night, Dr. Trevelyan. Mr. Holmes! No advice for me. My advice to you is to speak the truth. Outside, Watson expresses his confusion at his friend's dismissiveness. But Holmes knows that Blessington is hiding something. And speaking of Mr. Blessington, let's meet the second of tonight's special guests. In the role of Blessington, Mr. Patrick Newell. Born Patrick David Newell in 1932 at High Lodge Hadley in Suffolk, he began his education at Taunton School and finished at Oxford, where he studied medicine before serving as a captain in the Royal Army Medical Corps alongside fellow recruit Michael Caine. But after completing his national service, his attentions turned to the theater, and he began studying acting at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, where he came to worry that the talents of fellow students, including Peter O'Toole and Albert Finney, were far outpacing his own. So, in order to secure his own niche as an actor, he began to put on weight. And so, beginning in the 1950s, Newell appeared frequently in TV and film usually cast as a fat villain, or in rotund and stuffy comic roles. In fact, in 1958, he was cast as one of the inept recruits in the first of the Carry On films, Carry On Sergeant. But according to producer Peter Rogers, Newell showed up on the first day of filming 
only to recognize the real-life sergeant, hired to drill the cast, was the very one who'd made his life hell in the real army. Newell got into his Rolls Royce and drove off, never to be seen by that production again. Newell is probably best known for playing the role of the irascible character Mother in the Avengers TV series, which ran from 1965 to 1969. He appeared as the wheelchair-bound character a total of 20 times. Newell stated that landing the role of Mother was probably the best break of his career. But by the time his 1985 appearance in The Resident Patient rolled around, Newell was no stranger to the adventures of the great detective. Having appeared as Policeman Benson in the 1965 John Neville film, A Study in Terror, as well as appearing in 19 episodes of the 1979 series, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, as none other than Inspector Lestrade. The same year that he appeared in the Granada series, he also portrayed the doomed Bentley Bobster in the Steven Spielberg produced film, Young Sherlock Holmes, a film that I must admit I enjoy a great deal. And Newell's highly energetic and hallucinatory scenes at the start of that picture have remained with me since I first saw it as a lad. Newell once said of himself, I'm an actor with a weight problem. The more I diet, the less work I seem to get. But in spite of that, in the 1980s, Newell was successful in losing a substantial amount of weight, which he hoped would help with his failing health. But unfortunately, the damage was done. And in 1988, Patrick Newell died in Sussex of a heart attack at the age of 56. The next morning on Brook Street, Nora the servant girl knocks on Blessington's door eager to deliver his morning tea. But finding the door unlocked and ajar, she peers inside, only to be shocked by the terrible image of Blessington, dead, hanged by the neck from a rope above his bed. At 221B, a note arrives from Dr. Trevelyan, urging Holmes and Watson to come at once. Arriving on the scene, they are informed that Blessington has committed suicide. Holmes whistles. Upstairs, Holmes opens the door and is met with the horrifying vision of Blessington's corpse, still hanging. He greets the inspector on duty and makes a cursory examination of the room before grappling the dead man's body and, with the aid of the constables, lowering it onto a stretcher. Keith Frankel aptly describes the greatness of Jeremy Brett's performance in this uncomfortable moment. He writes, In instances such as these, Granada was able to exploit Jeremy Brett's almost metaphysical capacity to enrapture without saying a single word to the maximum. An ideal case in point would be the way he is able to use Holmes's harnessing of Blessington's dead weight to convey so much of the sleuth's neurotic psyche. Everything is communicated through expression. The sallow rigor mortis mask pales and slackens visibly. The lips loosen tackily, whilst the eyes distend in spooked distress. Seldom do we see the sleuth so thoroughly harried. After Blessington is taken away, Holmes inquires as to the inspector's progress. Have you heard of the events leading up to this affair? Yes, Dr. Trevelyan has told me something of them. But have you formed an opinion? Now, as far as I can see, the man was driven out of his senses by fright. The bed has been well slept in. There was his impression deep enough for all to see. It is about five in the morning, you know, that suicides are most common. That would be about the time that he hanged himself. Seems to be in a very deliberate affair. Yes, from the rigidity of the limbs, I'd say I've been dead about three hours. Thank you, Watson. Noticed anything peculiar about the room? 
There was a screwdriver on the mantelpiece, and he seems to have smoked heavily during the night. I found these in the fireplace. Holmes empties a small envelope of cigar butts into his hand, examining them closely. Have you his cigar holder? No, I haven't seen one. His cigar case, then? Yes, it was in his coat pocket. This is Havana. And these others are the cigars of the peculiar sort which are imported by the Dutch from their East Indian colonies. They're usually wrapped in straw, you know and are thinner for their length than any other brand. I don't suppose you've read my monograph on cigars and cigar ash. Well, I am um, the... No, of course not. Thank you. These have been smoked with a holder, and these without. These have been cut by a not very sharp knife, and these have had their ends bitten off by a set of very excellent teeth. There were three men here last night. Good heavens. It... But nothing was stolen, so what were they doing here? That is what we have to find out. Holmes begins a thorough examination of the room. And for almost three entire minutes, Jeremy Brett manages to entrance without the aid of dialogue or music. As he dances across the crime scene, scrutinizing every detail. Of this remarkable performance, Michael Cox recalled. Jeremy Brett always showed great enthusiasm for sequences in which Holmes investigated the scene of a crime. If there was a floor to throw himself on or a mantelpiece to climb, Jeremy would flare his nostrils in anticipation. He was very fond of the scrutiny of Blessington's room in this film not because it presented a physical challenge, but because it was carried out in absolute silence. He called it the Rafifi sequence, in honor of Jules Dassin's famous gangster film, in which a burglary lasting 25 minutes is conducted without sound. Our sequence lasts just under three minutes, but that is probably as long as a television audience will take before ringing the engineers to ask if there is something wrong with their sets. It was based on a short paragraph in the story, which is acted out in detail as Holmes collects fibers, dust, and ash from different surfaces in the room. This enables him to describe the crime, the judicial execution of Blessington, and to start a search for the perpetrators. In Bending the Willow, David Stewart Davies adds, this scene epitomizes the essence of Sherlock Holmes's minute investigation of a crime scene. All those passages that Conan Doyle created, describing his detective crawling on the floor, inspecting paintwork with his lens, and scraping dust or cigarette ash into a small envelope for analysis, are crystallized in this sequence. And Jeremy Brett knew it. Finished with his examination, Holmes has a clear picture of the evening's events, and to his compatriots, he expounds. There is no doubt as to the sequence of events. There were three of them in it. A young man, an old man, and a third, to whose identity I have no clue. The first two, I need hardly remark, were the same who masqueraded as the Russian Count and his son, so we can give a very good description of them, can we not, Dr. Trevelyan? They were admitted by a confederate inside the house. On entering the room, the first proceeding must have been to gag Mr. Blessington. Having secured Blessington, it is evident to me that a consultation of some sort was held, probably in the nature of a judicial proceeding. It must have lasted for some time, for it was then that the cigars were smoked. It was there that the older man sat, in the wicker chair. It was he who used the cigar holder. The younger man sat there. He knocked his ash off against the chest of drawers. The unknown fellow paced up and down. Blessington, I think, sat upright in the bed, but of that I cannot be absolutely certain. It ended, of course, by them taking... Blessington. 
Now, this matter was so prearranged that it is my belief that they brought with them some sort of block or pulley to serve as a gallows. Oh, yes, a gallows, Inspector. This was a revenge ritual. <laughs> what a, an extraordinary story. But what proof? I'll have it before the day's out. You haven't explained about the screws and the screwdriver. Oh, that was to fix up the block or pulley. But when they saw the chandelier hook, they naturally saved themselves the trouble. Now, Inspector, I suggest that you immediately make inquiries about the page and arrest him. Certainly, Mr. Holmes. I will be back here a little before three o'clock. Good day, sir. The hanging sequence depicted here is disturbingly effective and skillfully implemented. But when it came to British TV censors of the mid-80s, this scene was troublesome, to say the least. In Granada's Greatest Detective, Keith Frankel reports, Michael Cox contended with hierarchical pressure with regards to Blessington's death scene. In 1980s television drama, hanging was the method of death most commonly mimicked, meaning that the Broadcasting Standards Council, as it was known then, would have to grant approval of the scene before transmission. Deeming the presentation and context of the character's death to be appropriately discerning, the BSC approved broadcast of the unabbreviated cut. Michael Cox added, no one wants to be responsible for a tragedy and the controlling authorities showed a keen interest in scenes of this kind. In the event, they took a robust view and our version of Blessington's death survived intact. Back at Baker Street, Holmes pillages through piles of notes and records, verily undoing the bulk of Mrs. Hudson's spring cleaning. Watson arrives and is stunned by the sheer scope of the mess. I dare say Mrs. Hudson will be a little put out when she sees all this. What are you looking for? Worthington! W. Worthington! March! 1880, I'm sure. March 8. Watson makes his way to a file cabinet and, utilizing Mrs. Hudson's methodical system of organization, he quickly finds the folder in question. 80. January, February, March. Any good? What's up? Ecstatic, Holmes reveals an old newspaper, and together they rush out of the room. At Brook Street, Holmes presents his final evidence. Dr. Trevelyan, any news, Inspector? Yes, sir, we've got the page. Drinking his earnings, two streets away. And I've got the men. You've got them? Or at least I've got that identity. The Worthington Bank Gang? Precisely. Well, then Blessington must have been Sutton. Exactly. Well, that makes it clear as crystal. Uh, not to me, I'm afraid. Dr. Watson, would you... Uh... You may have heard of the great Worthington Bank affair. There were five men in it. The three who were in this room, a fourth named Cartwright, Blessing. Watson goes on to explain that the robbery went bad and the bank attendant was killed by the gang member, Cartwright, making it a hanging job. Sutton! You here? Sutton, or Blessington, who was the worst of the gang, turned informer. On his evidence, Cartwright was hanged and the other three got 15 years of peace. Biddle... Haywood and Moffat were released from prison just a few weeks ago, which was several years before their full term. It was news of their release which caused Blessington to panic and have this house secured. So it was not the fear of burglary that had frightened him? No, no, no. That was a mere blind. Ah. And so setting me up in practice was an elaborate charade to protect himself. Well, why could he not tell you this? 
He was trying to hide his own identity from everybody for as long as he could. His secret was shameful, and he couldn't bring himself to divulge it. However, wretch as he was, he was still living under the shield of British law. And I have no doubt, Inspector, that we shall see that though that shield may fail to guard, the sword of justice is still there to avenge. In spite of the efforts of the police, the gang was never brought to justice. But it was believed that they went down with the ship, the Nora Crena, as it sunk off the Portuguese coast. Back at Baker Street, Watson fumes. Frustrated by the musical stylings of his detective friend, he is unable to contain it any longer. Holmes! What's wrong? Well, it's just that I was going to spend the day writing. The case of Dr. Trevelyan, while the facts are still fresh. Oh, and you mean... Oh, I understand. Thanks awfully. It's just that it is difficult to concentrate otherwise. Uh, what will you entitle this particular account? <laughs> I didn't know you were interested in my writing. I am always interested in your choice of titles. Well, I thought I'd call it the Brook Street Mystery. No? Well, I myself would prefer the resident patient. But please do not let me influence you. The Brook Street mystery. No doubt would suffice. Watson's face sours at Holmes' suggestion, and he begins his chronicle with the original title intact. But after a moment's thought, he realizes that there may just be merit in his friend's suggestion. And after sitting with it for a moment, he smiles and underlines the final title, The Resident Patient. When asked by Peter Haining about his skills as a violinist, Jeremy Brett admitted, I can't play it, in fact but I have got pretty skillful at bowing the instrument. Mind you, to give the impression that I know what I'm doing, I do listen to the music for hours beforehand so that I have the feel of it. I have tried to vary my performances, sometimes playing in a very still fashion and in others with lots of movement. Recently, I even swung right around with my back to the camera, but still bowing the violin. Then I threw that scene at Patrick Gowers, who was the composer on the series, and challenged him to put music to it. He's a brilliant and inventive man, and so of course, he did. Haining also found it interesting to learn that Holmes' on-screen violin moments were actually played by Gower's then-teenaged daughter, Kathy. The reason being that Gower's felt that she would sound like a gifted amateur, the very status accorded to Holmes. first broadcast on the ITV network on September 15, 1985, at 9.45 p.m. Dramatized by Derek Marlowe and directed by David Carson. Now, we've met both of these gentlemen before. Derek Marlowe on The Greek Interpreter and David Carson on The Blue Carbuncle. And while Carson will return for The Six Napoleons and The Musgrave Ritual, this marks Marlowe's final appearance in the Granada series. Another name that will not be returning is that of Inspector Lanner, played here by John Ringham. Lanner only appeared in this single Conan Doyle story, but Ringham was a well-known character actor, appearing in over 200 roles on the big and small screens, everything from Doctor Who to Zed Cars. He was also a playwright and the author of three books, and he does a stellar job in this episode of the Granada series. But it's time to put this episode under the microscope and see how it holds up. So let's head over to the armchairs where the ever-scrupulous Luke 
awaits. Mr. Blessington has a physician to keep watch on his heart's bad condition, but the doctor fears harm, consults Holmes in alarm, for a wild panic, sans cause, brings suspicion. Isaac Asimov, well, I say we just jump right into this one. Yep. And I'll start with the very first shot. Dutch tilt, in a mirror, panning all the way across the room, straightening, because it was Dutch tilt, but only because of the mirror. Mm -hmm. And then coming all the way around the room back to him. I I love that shot. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's the perfect setup to I'm sticking to my guns to call one of my favorite, if not my favorite episode of the series. Mm. <laughs> I was wondering if the photo of the house on the nightstand was of any import. Hmm. I didn't think about that. I usually don't, but it was just on screen for a while. Yeah, I like the little bell that he has next to his bed. Is it a bell? Or it was, I thought it was like maybe a snuffer for some reason. Hmm, possibly. It's pretty, pretty it's big. It's big, but it's like as big as the candle next to him. Maybe. But maybe it's a bell. I kind of got the feeling it was a to ring for service. Yeah. The audio design, I have a note here. In this very first scene, you know, the Satan. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I really just want to give props to the audio department for this one and it's going to come up again but mm -hmm. here you know it's just saying Sutton I yeah. should have counted how many times but you know it's probably like a hundred <laughs> yeah and that but somehow his performance keeps it interesting you know the, 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 the as he's moving down the stairs and everything it, it, it all stays fresh yeah but it also keeps getting more and more like direct yeah and intense yeah but i mean like when he gets up to the coffin it sounds like he's in the room yeah i you know I, and i listened to it because again i knew i was going to make a note about the sound and it sounds like he's in the coffin mm -hmm. when he's right at the coffin and then when he runs back to the bedroom and you hear the voice in the bedroom behind him yeah they, they change the eq so that it sounds like it's more present right and it i mean what i watched it three or four times just to talk about it today and every single time i watched it it gave me chills and i really believe it's because of that audio design mm -hmm. because the change of the eq yeah you know or, or the mic or whatever it was but uh total props to the sound guys on that yeah that was really neat one thing i noticed and maybe you were already going to say this i i've watched this a couple times you know before we were going to do this episode but i only noticed it recently which is the um coffin lining matches the strong box really yeah it's like a I don't know, vaguely Chinese. Yeah. Thing. there's. I, I I didn't notice that, but I did notice a lot of fabric in mm -hmm. this episode. Especially, I made a note somewhere about uh, Blessington's suit. Oh, yeah. And how, like, the silver weave. It's like psychedelic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, uh, God bless HD. Yeah. I mean, like, it looks amazing. It's, it does. Uh, it's, yeah. it's just beautiful I design. I don't know what that's called. Yeah, I don't either. Speaking of clothes, this is your department, but... The mm. Hamburg in the barber shop. Yeah. So is it the same Hamburg? I, I'm. I'm. I, I feel like it's a different Hamburg than we have seen. But maybe I'm thinking of later episodes because I have been skipping around. He's got two, and I think, you know, I was looking at the Paget illustration, yeah. and I think they're just trying to match that because it's kind of a light gray. Yeah. Um, and he definitely has a brown one with like a reddish, um, brim. I always think of this one as a green, but I guess gray. I think it looks green, and I would like it. To believe that it was green, but it's pretty sure it's light gray. Yeah, interesting. And then just some color balance. It looks a little ragged to me in this one. Yeah. Maybe it's just because we're seeing it so close up and kind of from an, a lower angle. Yeah. But it doesn't seem as kept as some of his later hats. Yeah, could be an, an older hat that they were using or something. Yeah. So as they walk back arm in arm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's from the pageant illustration. Right. Which is Which is pretty neat. I love this moment. Um, this could easily go in my best of moments, but um, their deductions about the carriage and the doctor. Yeah. Very, very reminiscent of the meeting with Mycroft, which is, it, it, it's very close to the story, but it's you can tell they tweaked it just a little bit to make it a little bit more reminiscent of that exchange with Mycroft, I think. I yeah. Want, I want to believe it. It could did. be, yeah. yeah. Because it was different in the story. Yeah. But, and also not to just say something that was maybe one of my favorite things in this episode. <laughs> But the fact that Watson's humming the score. Oh, yeah. Like, 
ba, 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 like the music matches yeah them. oh yeah i thought that was a really nice touch see and and I'm, we're gonna jump around but people really have criticized this episode more than i would have imagined until i started looking into it keith frankel talks pretty disparagingly about it frankly quite a few of the books kind of put it lower on the list they all acknowledge that this beginning is incredibly strong the the intro scene with sutton the um, exchange in the barber shop, the music, the reveal in the window with Mrs. Hudson, they, they all acknowledge that's all very strong, but they kind of act as though after that it's just kind of a mediocre episode and, mm. and on the low end of what we've seen so far. I'm just going to flat out disagree. Me too. I, I feel like <laughs> it's going to be really hard for me to find anything bad to say about this one, and I just am going to be gushing about it the whole time because every frame is brilliant. Everything looks great. Everything's lit well. Um, the, All I, the performances are great. Oh, the performances are just so top, top, top notch. I think the problem is because the beginning is so great, and it, you know it's starting you on such a high. It, they're not maintaining the momentum. Yeah, in a sense. Well, I I think maybe just because it's not as much Sherlock, which actually uh, Watson says in the story. Yeah, you know that this one, you know, he's not in it as much. Right, right. Um, this is he did two kinds of of stories, ones right. where it was all about his deductions and ones where it was just an interesting news right. item or something. But I think that maybe there's that and then there's a lot of critique about his theory on the page. Yeah. Which I still think, I don't know, I don't agree with a lot of the annotations. Right. Um, but especially that one. Yeah. Well, hopping back in then, Holmes Pipe here, mm -hmm. I believe this is the new church warden. It's not the old one. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if the old one is going to make another appearance, and I, I kind of lost track for a second there, but I believe that we've lost the old pipe at this point, and we're on to Holmes's replacement church warden. Hmm. Uh, and for listeners who may or may not recall, there, there was a point where Jeremy Brett said that his pipe was stolen on set, or lost. They're not yeah, entirely sure. the long one. The, yeah, it was church long, warden. and it was, it was clearly antique -y. It just right. had a quality to it. This one... It looks like it just came off the shelf. I actually bought this exact same pipe at one point yeah. to Peterson. It's a great pipe. It's it looks beautiful. It's really nice. It just clearly is not old. Right. So to go back right before that though, the crane shot. Yeah. Is which is like a trick crane shot. There's like a dissolve on the window screen. Right. As Mrs. Hudson opens it, it turns to a different camera and then pushes through into the room. Yeah. It's a nice little Oh, yeah. Kind of old school trick. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And I love Mrs. Hudson right in that moment, her little smile. Mm -hmm. I, it's, oh, man. It just... I think she knew how special that shot was. <laughs> she's got a couple of great moments in this one. Yeah, uh, and she and she's not in the story. No, yeah, exactly. No, this, I, I love this episode. I see, I think they did a lot. <laughs> I think the, the makers of the show did a lot to this episode. Yeah. And I think it was all good. Yeah, great, great writing, great directing, just everybody, top of their game. Well, so here we are. Percy Trevelyan has arrived. He's um, giving them the backstory. Uh, we'll get to the books, I guess, in a moment. But there is a, a, a moment in the book here that I, I really liked that isn't in the episode. I, I, I guess it's not necessary. But it was the um, kind of the differentiation was that Percy was actually saving up. He was planning to save all his pennies for 10 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he would start his practice in Brook Street. Yeah. So, so he was on a trajectory, and that's why he was kind of living in poverty and, you know, doing all this because he was, he had a real plan to get there on his own. But I just thought that was neat. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think about this episode a lot, and I do wonder, why did Blessington hire a doctor? Like, he could have hired anyone, I guess, but he went and kind of found an up-and-coming doctor who I guess he could get cheap, mm -hmm. and, but, you know, surely no cheaper than, like, a security guard. Right. I thought that was a kind of a weird choice. See, see what you're describing there. We need a word for it. We'll call it Conan Doyleism, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I feel like that on most of these. To be honest, you yeah. know what I mean. It's, there's always some kind of like use suspension of disbelief. Frankly, it's it's genius that he's always able to find it and create a story that throws you off because it's just yeah, it's just slightly out of the ordinary. Skew, yeah, yeah, but really for no reason. It's like his version of Hitchcock's MacGuffins. Yes, exactly. But in a different way. Yeah. And I, as, as you say that, I do recall in, in a lot of the books, the Keith Frankel and, uh, and others, the word MacGuffin is often used. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it, it is and it isn't because it, it's just a weird plot point. Like, I wonder if it was 
somebody told them a story yeah. similar to this or if there was a a crime that happened similar to this and it was just so weird yeah. and striking that you just have to use it. Well, I, I only read the story once in preparation for talking, but in the show, at least they do show a picture of Trevelyan, you know, with a, with a stethoscope and and mentioning that his heart was weak and right. you know, so so maybe maybe there's a secondary He does say his heart is weak but not abnormal. Abnormal, right. yeah. So getting back to the episode, the moment where Percy fast forwards in the story to where they arrive at his consulting room on Brook Street. <laughs> Do you know how many horses pass by the frame in that one shot? <laughs> no. <laughs> Eight horses. Yeah. A couple of a couple of pairs, but uh technically seven that pass by plus their cab. But it's it's just one shot where they're just shooting the front door while the, the housekeeper is Polishing, polishing the plaque for a long time yeah. right and there's dialogue happening but gee yeah tons of horses and people my gosh what an expensive shot mm -hmm. and it's it's but they're all like really close to camera and out of focus so it's you know well it feels busy yeah well like it certainly certainly does brook street but yeah i had to count the horses because it just struck me as wow that's a lot of horses yeah so we go inside and there's a page but i can't tell if it's the exact same page from the end yeah it is are you sure? Oh, no, 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 no. The very first one is not. Okay, because they do make a point to say he's a new page. He's, yeah, you know, yeah. No, that first guy they show is definitely not the same guy. I mean, it's almost not worth doing. You know, it's almost not worth casting two people for that small of a thing. But, like, again, I thought it was a interesting attention to detail. Yeah. To, to make it so that the next guy is definitely new. Oh, yeah. So here's a question for you. I don't know if it's a question, but there's a little moment in this episode where, uh, where the two Russian... Uh, noblemen come in or whoever they are and uh, sit down with Dr. Trevelyan and he asks him, you know, do you drink alcohol? And he's like, vodka, vodka, I see, every day. Yeah. And then he, he looks over at his book mm -hmm. and starts reading for a couple seconds and then turns the page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a strange choice. There's a lot, not a lot, there's a few strange choices from him. Yeah. Like when he wants to yell at the page later. Yeah. And there's this shot that comes in the room, and we come all the way behind the desk, and then he sits down, the page closes the door, and then he starts Tapping putting his, his fingers. fingers on the, you know, like, yeah. just some interesting... Well, that one was cool because he did it in frame, yeah. you know, so it, it looked nice. But this one, I was just kind of like, is that normal, that he would just be so disinterested in what he's doing that he would resort to the book he was reading? I mean, well, maybe he was referencing something. I think something. he was supposed to be, like, referencing, he may be, you know... Like, yeah. Oh. Vodka. Let me look that up. Boy. Yeah, yeah. I just thought it was kind of a. It, yeah. it works really well, and it's 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 amusing and it's fun to watch. But it uh, made me yeah. made a question mark pop up over my head. Speaking of question marks, I mean, you know, reading the story and then watching the episode, some things work better the way it is in the in the, in the original story. Some things work better in the episode. Yeah. Like when he goes to get the nitrite of amyl. Yeah, amyl nitrite, yeah. Yeah, like he he goes in there and obviously it's like 20 seconds. Yeah, yeah. And then they're all just gone. Yeah. In the in the story it says like it takes him 5 minutes to do it. Yeah. And then in the story um they come back right. and they have like a 30 minute consultation while the other guys like searching the, the grounds. Yeah. So yeah, I like, mean, yeah. You wouldn't want to do that in this in the TV show. Exactly. But I feel like they did it as best as it could have been done for a TV show. Right. No, you I know, know what I mean? Like and honestly, that moment when he goes back and he makes the mix or it's not even a mix if you watch caref carefully, he's just pouring it from one bottle into another and then he's Yeah, he done. Just pours it into like a big cup to measure it and right. then into a little vial. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it does take a while. Uh, for yeah. you know from a TV watching point of view, it's kind of a long moment. Like it's not 5 minutes. No, but, but it's enough to kind of make the viewer go, okay, he was gone for a while. You know what it's I mean? It's all you can do. But again, I kind of found myself questioning, like, what were they doing? You know, like, at first I thought they were searching for his money, but that's not the intention of being in there. Yeah, it is kind of a strange... I, I kind of always imagined they were just confirming that that was him. Right. That was his room. That's where he slept. You know, that was actually the right guy. And they were making their plan to come back. Yeah, see, like, that whole thing is a little vague, and it's vague with the page, and, and there's an argument in the annotations that the page wasn't involved. Right. And, like, you know, they, they compare Holmes to you know, a blunder of Lestrade. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a couple of annotations in different books that, that bring that up. I feel like the episode, though, made the choice to make it very clear. Well, they did. They show him yeah. opening the door for the bad guys. Well, that's true. Yeah. But I think the fact that Holmes 
decides later on that there has to have been someone inside yeah should tell you you know that it that he was sure and so if there was somebody inside he would have known he would have known who it was because they also come at the exact 30 minute window while he's gone right maybe they were just you know examining the lock looking at the windows you know just casing the joint and making sure it's just a weird point because they show up with screwdrivers and things and then they realize they don't need them right so like if they were in there for 30 minutes looking around they you know i don't know well right yeah i mean i can't remember the story exactly but i feel like there's some kind of wording somewhere that says it was just a matter of luck that he didn't come back because if he had a come back from his walk they would have just killed him then probably right it's something like that was somewhere yeah it's just it it was just one of those doyle things yeah conan doyleisms well my next little happy face note is holmes shaking out his umbrella inside the house (laughs) (laughs) yeah like it's, it's a good little shot because it starts on his umbrella and it's actually quite wet and he's just shaking it all over the floor all over the rug. Yeah. Everyone else had managed to do so outside, but he does that. And But, I mean, the reason they do it is because in that next moment, they all hand their gloves and hats to the page. Yeah. And uh, kind of establish, even in the smallest possible, probably unnecessary way, that there's a page. We all see him. And so then when Holmes comes back later and says, where's the page? Right. You know. And they all just kind of dump their hats on him. And yeah. And he looks like, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's a it's a detail. Yeah. It's a good detail. Um. One thing I noticed, and I don't know if it was a real thing, but um, when Blessington is having the window bars put on, yeah, the 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 paint is like rubbing off where he had his hand. Really? Yeah, I didn't notice that. So I wondered if it was just you know they just got some plastic and painted it black or something. Could be. Or if they just painted it just for that shot, and then it was just rubbing off because they have any times they did or something. But what I thought you were gonna say there was, I noticed the guy who's hammering in the thing, mm-hmm. his hammer hits Blessington at one point. It kind of like... Oh, he's, really? he, yeah, oh, it hits his, his coat. I don't know how hard it actually hit the actor, but... Huh. I didn't notice <laughs> he was, that. Yeah, he's just kind of swinging and not looking and uh, kind of whacked him with the hammer a little bit. Yeah. There's a shot where, you know, Nora, the servant, brings up the tea and she goes up the stairs yeah. and the camera follows her and goes up the stairs the whole time. Right. I, I mean, you know, just it's, it's a dolly shot of sorts, an extending... Crane. Crane, yeah. Mm-hmm. And... uh really nice yeah you know making use of the space following her all the way up the winding stairs kind of like a salmon colored oh yeah yeah very very red vivid weird colors yeah and it it shows in their faces especially in that moment when uh holmes arrives and they're all standing there outside the room yeah they all look a little bit more red than usual Mm -hmm. i think though i think the lighting in this episode is just overall exceptional like better than almost any episode up to this point yeah um especially even on on Blessington when he's hanged whatever they did they just lit him in a way that just made it you know spooky yeah there there was some pretty interesting language about Blessington when he's hanging like you know looking like a having a chicken neck with like a huge body or something you know yeah, like to yeah. make him look even fatter and like they definitely made him look like a big mass you know yeah which again I mean, I don't think you could have done the stretch neck without, you no, know, like without special effects. No, but like fat ankles hanging out the bottom. Yeah, that so. was very well done. I will say that the Paget illustrations, he's not fat at all in the pictures. Right. Plus Blessington, which I was kind of surprised by, frankly, the yeah. illustrations. Um, but no, I think I think he was really just perfect casting in that regard. I Actually, one thing I would really like to know is if it is, in fact, Patrick Newell's hand when he's hanging there. You know, when, when Holmes is, is, is checking and push, you know, he kicks the, the yeah. strong box underneath him and his hand is there. And if it's not Patrick Newell, it's a good hand match because yeah. it's the same chubby hand. He's got the ring on. Yeah. It really does look like his hand. But then when they lower his body down, it's actually like a very long shot. But it almost looks as though Watson is trying to block his head so that you can't tell it's not the actor. I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't get that feeling. Yeah. But I did get the feeling of, they were like, we didn't figure out what I'm doing with my arms. Yeah. So he's holding his <laughs> arms to his body. Oh, yeah. And he slowly slides them down as they're laying him down. Yeah. Because it was like, you know, yeah. we didn't really work this action out. <laughs> but he was a big guy. I mean, even mm-hmm. it's like three people get him down, and it seems like he's bigger than all of them put together. Yeah. Another, just one quick note, the makeup on him, too. Yeah. Just like, he looks so frazzled in, in the shots previous, you know, like sweating and yeah. like dark eyes. and Yeah just another great point to this to this episode yeah and i just i love patrick newell i mean i love everybody in this one but patrick newell 
I don't know. He he he's just it's such a great performance. I mean, watching it over and over again as I do for the podcast, I just felt like never got old. It just got better every time. Yeah. Um just so nuanced and so competent and so professionally done and just sporadic. Yeah. I mean, it, I you could argue that maybe it's easy to play the crazy guy kind of a thing, but um I don't know. I I feel like he just did an exceptional job. Yeah, I agree. And and you know, speaking of, you know, you counted horses um, I counted minutes uh, in one scene with no dialogue. Oh, you mean the uh, Rafifi moment? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, it wasn't quite that long, but yeah. um, I, you know, I basically timed it. I, I wasn't paying that close attention, but it was three minutes. Yeah, and he, you know, he says Watson, don't, don't move. Yeah, that's the only thing he says th- in those three minutes, which in TV time, that's a lot of time. Oh yeah, yeah, especially yeah. between commercial breaks. Oh yeah, Michael Cox talks about it uh, in the book, and he's like, it's a no no. Yeah, and especially for the BBC or ITV or whatever, because people literally back then would call in and say, "My TV is not working." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, it's uh, a it's a it's a moment, it's a scene, and I mean, a lot of great stuff there. You know, when when Watson's sitting in the chair and you know, he reaches behind him, he has to like again because it's HD, you notice these things. But he covers the hair really quickly with his hand when Watson leans forward. Yeah, as he's like searching for it, you know, so you don't see it right yeah. right in front of the camera lens. Right, but right. Just yeah. just good good stuff in there. yeah exactly a lot of details in this one um the model boat that watson is building yeah it's not in the story but the writer obviously uh and i think i think this got mentioned in a previous episode when somebody was mentioning the resident patient but this writer he knew of watson's love of nautical stories so he threw that in there as a little detail right Trevelyan's note i didn't notice it till the very last time i watched but it's it's not a telegram that he sends it's an actual like note that he scribbled on a piece of paper and yeah. had someone run over. Yeah. And if you look at it in the episode, it's like a piece of like ledger paper or something that's been ripped off. Right. So that was maybe a prescription page or something. Yeah. But I thought that was a great detail that they actually differentiated it from a telegram or, you know, something right. like that. I thought that was really neat. Another great thing about that scene is when Watson is reading the note and he crushes it and it cuts to the next scene. Yeah. That transition, you know, reminiscent of that Lawrence of Arabia shot we always talk about. Yeah, exactly. That was a good one. So here's a question for you. At the beginning of Holmes's um, examination of the room when he's looking at the cigar butts, he mentions that he knows that three men were present uh, from the cigars, but he only has cigars from two men. Well, he has three, doesn't he? No, because he, he holds up four cigars, and he says these two were cut with very good teeth, these two were cut with something else. And then these were in a, a holder, and these weren't. Yeah, but he only has two sets. Yeah, I don't know. if I, I wasn't paying attention that closely, but I assumed he meant, like, these ones were cut, these ones were chewed, this one was in a holder, and then these ones weren't. Like, he was he was separating them. Maybe. I got the feeling that it was he only had two, but he said three men. But, but And also, when he starts looking on the ground in his Rafifi moment, he finds another butt. Yeah. But if you watch the episode and you watch the the flashback moments, the third man doesn't actually smoke. He mm-hmm. just walks around. So, I mean, I guess he says at one point, he's like, I saw their traces. So maybe he just saw their footprints when he came in. Well, he said he the meant. one guy was sitting, yeah. putting a cigarette, you know, putting his putting his cigar out the whole time. And then the other, the old man was sitting in the other chair. Yeah, but it just it just seemed that he, it seemed in that moment that he was making the deduction based on just those cigarette butts. Yeah. And it just, again, it's like, it's one of those moments like in the Norwood Builder when he seems to solve the case just by looking at the building but then he doesn't solve it for a long time right. you know so it just it, it felt like the timing was strange but um i guess it could be explained it could be i mean i guess i, I could go either way on that one i do i do like the fact w- one of the notes i made was when he says you know these have been smoked with the holder these without these have been cut by a not very sharp knife the way he says cut right there yeah i can't reproduce it but i love it <laughs> I there's so much I love in that scene and which I'm saving all for my good good and my Jeremy moments but well not to go into one of those yeah. but um well something that I noticed that was kind of half in the book and half in the episode that in a weird way to me came together finally was Blessington was hanged using his own strong box yeah the window bars he was tied to the window bars that, right. that he put in <laughs> yeah and in the story um it's his rope Really? Oh, that's right. Because he was going to use the rope in case there was a fire so he can climb out. Yeah. So in a weird way, you know, between the story and the episode, his undoing was all 
of his own making. Of his own making, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's pretty neat. I never thought about that. <laughs> Going back to sound effects, when they hang Blessington, I, I, I feel like you could never give somebody an award for that. <laughs> for one sound effect? <laughs> well, for the for that sequence. It's like, you know, there it's it, there's no sound, there's no music. They pull on the rope, he starts gagging, they pull it again, it gets taut. Then they kick out the thing, and then he like falls, and like you hear like the bones crunch, mm -hmm. a a and I mean it's so ghastly and horrible, but I mean it's so amazing, you know what I mean? Your whole body tenses when you watch that moment because it's just so so well done. And honestly, you know what the thing is that really pulls it all together? Blessington seems like <laughs> he must weigh, I don't know, two hundred and fifty pounds, mm -hmm. and they got the weight of that sound right in right. that swinging rope from that chandelier hook the poundage yeah exactly and yet yep. it, and it's just so and you're thinking like the whole ceiling's going to collapse right but it, it adds tension to it and i don't know it's Literally. just such a such a great moment yeah another thing about him hanging is like when he's discovered and the music that kicks in it's the same music from uh, the greek interpreter when latimer falls off the train is it yeah, that oh, yeah. really really screechy violins. Oh, right, right, right. I, right, love. Right, I think right. it's great. Yeah. So effective. Is it the exact same cue, though, or did they redo it? I couldn't... I'm pretty sure it's the exact same one. Really? Interesting. I'll have to check that. Because it, it comes in and it's like, it's piercing. Yeah. I, I would be surprised if it wasn't. Yeah. Just because the, that performance on the violin was amazing. Yeah. Uh, one more thing about that scene with Inspector Lanner. Yeah. He reminds me of Doyle himself. Yeah, the way he looks. Just the way he looks, yeah, like the way his hair is and his mustache. Yeah, yeah, he's only in this one. And they uh, don't even say his name in the episode. Oh, that's right, they don't, they yeah. They just say Inspector. Yeah, he was good. Yeah. He was good, everybody in this is good. Well, this episode has so very few notes uh, in in the TV show books. There's there's really not a lot of trivia, there's not a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, I was I was really quite sad. I had to dig kind of to find stuff to to fill the episode up with but you know m more than that i just felt like th this is one of my favorite episodes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> why isn't there more stuff uh, i wonder if as we go on if there's going to be fewer notes just because it's you know the first season for the first two seasons yeah then maybe they kept better notes and then well it's gonna, it's going to be interesting unless june windham davies writes a book or has written one and i'm not aware of it you know michael cox he's not there all the time he, right. he leaves and he comes back uh, in in a, in a different capacity. I mean, he comes back as a producer, but more of as a hired producer. That's kind of what I mean, though. Like the yeah, the, the people that you know started yeah. it, maybe. Well, I've I've read his whole book, um, and when he he does comment on the episodes that he really had nothing to do with, so he has some insights, but it's not going to be you know right. ears to the ground kind of information. So yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see. I. I don't know. I'm. I'll just uh, take a moment to complain. You know, the television Sherlock Holmes book by Haining. Why oh why can't someone make an index for that book? <laughs> There's no yeah. index, mm. and so it's so hard to find anything in that book. I, I feel like I need to take like a month and just go through there and like cross reference and index it myself. I'd like to believe someone. I was just gonna say, why don't you do? <laughs> well, I know. I'd like to believe someone else has done it, and I won't have to. But <laughs> well, I mean, you're probably the most familiar with it at the moment. Yeah, I wish somebody would do the same thing for those Sherlock Holmes gazettes because oh, uh, the, yeah. those magazines. My, it's like it takes so long to go through that stuff. But anyway, let's dive into the books themselves for a moment. The story. I say the books, but just the story. This one was first published in August of 1893 in the Strand and in Harper's Weekly, not Collier's this time. Mm. Um, my first book note is this, and it's from the Klinger book, and it talks about catalepsy. <laughs> oh, yeah? I don't know if you have big notes about catalepsy. I don't but... think I had any. But... So I, I, I won't read from the book exactly. I'll just read from my notes. But it says, um, catalepsy is a symptom of other diseases like epilepsy and schizophrenia. It's not a disease itself. So I guess, the, you know, the point is like, catalepsy kind of like brain fever was it was actually a popular malady used in fiction of the 19th century mm. um, it appears in many stories including edgar Allan poe's premature burial wherein the narrator is a cataleptic who is afraid someone will mistake him right for dead yeah. and bury him alive um poe po used it a couple times actually he used it in uh, fall of the house of usher also um but 
I just thought it was interesting because it's Conan Doyle who has some medical history. Well, I wonder uh, if it was evolving at that point, you know, or, well, that's or true. things were emerging, I should say, at that point, you know, I mean, if it was just basically a seizure. Yeah. But we called it like, oh, you have catalepsy because you, this happens to you. Right. But, but yeah. It, Maybe it, it just hadn't been delineated in that right. way just right. yet. Yeah. But I thought it was interesting. Yeah. My notes uh, from the Baron Gould. I always just find myself arguing with the annotations. Yeah. I mean, usually they're just about dates. So, like, I don't really, doesn't yeah. really bother me. But yeah. Um, there's some weird justifications in this one, and which I thought was funny because uh, in the story it's October. And then in the episode, they're like, uh, Miss Hudson was doing some spring cleaning. Right. <laughs> so it's like they just, again, you know, didn't, didn't even matter to them. It's, yeah. But Well, it doesn't matter, really. It doesn't, except... <laughs> to those guys. If you're writing a book. Yeah, I noticed. I, I, I only leafed quickly through the Baring Gould, but yeah, there's a lot of little notes like, this can't be a Saturday because he said two days ago it was the weekend. Right. You know, or whatever. Just, well, that, that, there's like 20 of those. That was the thing, though. I mean, I guess, you know, when you put them all together, you could get somewhere, but like, yeah, they were like, well, he said two days ago and they don't, you know, the mail wouldn't have gone on Saturday, but but they said there was no postmark or no date on the envelope. So maybe somebody just stuck it in the door. Right. You know, so like there's a lot of justification, which I thought was just a bit weird. Well, I also and, think it's funny because in the very beginning of this story, Watson flat out says, I didn't actually have very good notes for this one. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, and like, you know, they, they go, uh, well, uh, the Russian guy was going to come over. So that has been a weekday. And it's like, well, he says specifically, I want to come and I want to make sure you're at your house. Yeah. W- weird wording you know, to, to, to us, I think. But, yeah. you know. Well, speaking of that house, the Cavendish Square Quarter that Dr. Trevelyan aspires to um, in the book, he mentions it, I guess that's where Brook Street lies, uh, is the place known for housing London's most exclusive medical practitioners. It's referenced in much fiction, uh, referred to the Citadel of Medicine in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, Florence Nightingale worked there, but Mm -hmm. also... Arthur Conan Doyle, before he was a sir, had offices there at 2 Upper Wimpole Street in 1891 when, as a younger man, he was attempting to establish himself as a practicing eye specialist. Interesting. So, yeah, he was he mm. was there. Huh. Uh, so he, he was writing from experience. Yeah. But, yeah, that's from the Klinger book also. Um, one thing from the story that just, just kind of jumped out at me this time around... I think Watson refers to the page as a small page. Mm. And then at the end, um, when Holmes says that he's involved, Trevelyan just goes, the young imp. <laughs> and so I was like, is he meant to be a little person? Uh, That's kind of a weird, I mean, or I he was just a slight. Yeah. just But a small page was just a weird wording to me. Mm. Well, here's a note that will probably only interest our American listeners, but there's a note in the Klinger book Uh, explaining the denominations of British currency because a guinea is worth 21 shillings and there are 12 pence in a shilling. So a five and threepence is exactly one quarter of a guinea. Yeah. Which is not instinctive for Americans because it's kind of the opposite of the um, metric slash imperial difference. We're, We're used to one through 10 uh, in every denomination of money. <laughs> yeah. So it was just a little confusing. But along those lines, I wanted to say I brought something that I purchased at the Sherlock Holmes Museum on our first trip, which is a historical coins of Great Britain. Wrapped in plastic. Genuine pre-decimal coins, full collection. And it comes with a uh, a farthing, a half penny, a penny, a brass threepence, a sixpence, a shilling, a florin, or two shilling piece, and a half crown. And um, if any of you are British and wondering who buys this kind of thing, it's us American tourists. <laughs> we buy your old money for probably ten times what it cost. Well, I have one thing I can add to that. Hmm. Um, to this day, and you know this, Brian May of Queen plays guitar with a sixpence. Yeah. Um, and so there is like a whole market... For people selling old sixpences to people like me. Really? Who want to have them. Are they hard to get? Not really. Okay. What do you pay for an old one? Uh, You, you just buy a lot of them. Oh, okay. You know, I think I bought like 50 for like $10 or something. Hmm. More than six pence, but... Nice. 
Did you, have you ever actually accidentally found one like in your change when we were over there? No, 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 no. But I always find them in my pocket because I just keep them <laughs> everywhere. Nice. Well, okay. Here's one other factoid for maybe people who don't know. Do you know what a penny farthing is? No. Penny farthing bicycle. Oh right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's based on the penny and the penny farthing. It's the shape of the tire of the wheels. Yeah, I mean that's cool. I don't remember if if a penny farthing ever appears in the Granada series. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know. I know that we have a project where one might appear. <laughs> we'll see if that happens. So I have a few notes here on amyl nitrate, actually. This was actually not prescribed <laughs> as a method of dealing with cataleptic fits. Oh, okay. Well, maybe he was just trying stuff. Yeah, well, apparently it actually has no reported effect on it. Uh, but it's not totally unheard of. But more often it's used to treat, like, nervous conditions but actually, what it's mainly used for, the street name of amyl nitrate, is poppers, club drug, Yeah. now illegal in the U.S. and only by prescription in the U.K. So basically, that's what he was giving the old man was poppers. Mm. <laughs> I think the first time I ever heard it referred to is Fight Club. Oh, really? When uh, Edward Norton's going to the, the cancer club or yeah. whatever, the cancer meeting. Yeah. And then there's a the girl that wants to have sex for the last time. And she's like, I have lubricants, I have amyl nitrate. And she gets into the microphone real close, you know. I don't remember that, but now really? I, will, I will look for it. <laughs> they pull the mic away from me, like, okay, you know. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah, 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 now I remember that. Well, I actually did write down a note from the Klinger book um, about the dates, but it's, it's it dates in a different way, because there was some question about the date of the crime versus the date of the trial, versus when they would have been released. Apparently, it doesn't really add up. Oh, right. But the thing I found interesting about the Klinger note here is that Holmes would have been just 21 years old when the Worthington Bank gang would have been in the headlines. Hmm. So long before he began his professional detective career. But I guess if it was big news, I suppose he would have kept the clipping, maybe. Well, apparently he did. Yeah. <laughs> At least in the TV episode, he did. Right. The thing that I found the most that made me think about the episode was in the story I, I don't know I didn't do the research to figure out how old Holmes would be at this moment mm. but it would be easy to figure that out because he would have been 21 when the Worthington Bank thing happened Right. but I wonder if it would correspond to how old Jeremy Brett was in this Probably show because I think he was yeah 50 yeah he was a little older yeah yeah but that, you know that's interesting and, you in, know, in that way it works better because he would have been in his, you know, right. more than likely right. into his career at that point. I mean, I can't remember exact wording on the note in the um, Baron Gould, but they talk about that. And, you know, they, they even had, like, they broke it down. They're like, uh, if you were released for good behavior, you would have been in jail for this many days. Right. Like, like there was no play in that. Right. So that was a little strange. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, maybe that's how it is over there. Yeah. Well... We could devote an entire separate podcast to dissecting the dates. Nah. <laughs> Instead, let's talk about the good, the bad, and the Jeremy. All right. I feel like we could call the good, we could change it for this episode to call it the Watson. Yeah. There's a <laughs> lot of Watson stuff. <laughs> there's a lot of good Watson. My first note is the barbershop scene, obviously. Right. And, but more than the scene itself is just Watson's face. Yeah. And it's, there, there's so many ups and downs to it, but the moment that really gets me is that incredulous face when Holmes tells him he's wrong about all his deductions, and he just looks sickened. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just love it so much. Well, my favorite part is when he's like, well, there is some truth to it, and he's like, ha! Yeah, yeah. Just the smile. Just, yeah. you know. By no means. Yeah. <laughs> that whole scene when Trevelyan's talking, and, and he's like really kind of, playing to watson you know yeah. he, like watson keeps interjecting he's like R for sure you know yeah. yes yeah <laughs> very interesting now let me get back to my story right i will say too probably the best watson may maybe the best david burke watson sequence of the entire series in my view yeah well maybe excluding the very end of uh the final problem but the end titles of this one oh yeah yeah because it's just yeah. Watson acting with his face for two minutes. Yeah. It's it's so mouthing great. the titles. Yeah, yeah. All that. Thinking about it and you know, just fr from the moment when when Holmes says, I prefer the resident patient, and he just kinda like looks disgusted again. Yeah. Like, come on, what? Yeah. <laughs> you gotta be kidding. You're no writer. And then by the end he's worked it out in his mind so that he 
he accepts it and it's the best one and then it, it, the look on his face is though he came up with it yep in the and, last moment and it's brilliant yeah <laughs> yep um i like when when uh they're revealing you know blessington was sutton and everybody's like oh that makes it totally clear now and trillian's like uh not to me and then Watson holds up the newspaper backwards, and yeah. he's like, "We have this guy, this guy, this guy, and whoosh, and he flips it over, yeah. you know, while he's holding his tea. You know, it's just just a nice moment." Yeah. The next thing on my good list is just uh, Patrick Newell, and we already talked about him, but I just think he deserves special note. Um, he's just so great. He was good in Young Sherlock Holmes, also. I know some people don't like that movie, uh, and others do, but I, it's a movie that I grew up with, and it's always had a special place. In my heart, he plays Bentley Bobster at the very beginning. He's the first one who has a hallucination. And so he gets the benefit of a big special effects-y kind of start to the movie. And if you haven't seen Young Sherlock Holmes, I don't know where you can watch it. It's out there somewhere. But it has a lot of connections to to Sherlock Holmes. I mean, <laughs> it's Sherlock yeah. Holmes. But Nigel Stock is in it. He plays uh, Young Sherlock Holmes' mentor, Professor Waxflatter. Obviously, Nigel Stock from the Peter Cushing, Douglas Wilmer, Sherlock stuff. And um, Freddie Jones. Freddie Jones is in it, obviously. He's Who's in, in two episodes of this? Yeah. Um, as two different characters? Yeah, there's quite a few people who just make little appearances who are in the Granada series. So if you haven't seen that and you've thought it's not worth your time, it kind of is. It's pretty good. It's it's good in its own way. It's If you go into it knowing it's not Sherlock Holmes and it's not canon, you might enjoy it. I would say it's probably worth your time but it's almost like Flash Gordon. You have to be committed to get through it. I tried to watch it like last year and I couldn't finish it. Here's what I would recommend. Watch all the Harry Potter movies <laughs> and then watch Young Sherlock Holmes and you'll see that they basically took a lot of stuff from Young Sherlock Holmes sure. for Harry Potter. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. It's 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 dated and it's kind of awkward in its, in its own way, but... It has one, its own charm, but you you just have to be ready for it. But if you get used to it and you watch it a few times and you find yourself liking it, it it rewards upon multiple views. Yeah, and the performances are good. They're 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 pretty good. I didn't I didn't remember that scene with the sword fight. Yeah, I, I was looking through IMDb and I was like, I thought that was from like Who Framed Roger Rabbit or something. <laughs> you mean with the the the, the like animated yeah, sword? Yeah, that was the very first CG animated uh, character mm. in film. Well, damn. Yeah. There's another reason to watch it. Yeah. I would comment on... I mean, we already commented on Blessington's Psychedelic Fest. Yeah. But um, just his whole outfit in the scene where he visits Trevelyan for the first time. Mm -hmm. I just wrote down Disney villain. <laughs> or like the penguin. Or like Roger yeah. Stone's fashion icon. I suppose. I mean, what it what it said to me was just he had a lot of money. You know, he was just I know, but really... it was just weird. Like, yeah. he, I mean, just his whole, his face, like his hairdo and like his ears sticking out a little bit with like the top yeah. hat with like the, you know, the hairy top hat. The fuzzy top hat. I feel like that's, we see that top hat, uh, like other people wear it in the yeah. series quite a few times. And the kind of odd colors of it too. Yeah. You know, like the light, like, you know, aqua yeah. band on it. It's like, it's just a, it's just a bizarre look. Also in my good list, Mrs. Hudson and her screaming moment when they leave the room in shambles. Yeah. I'd say maybe the best Mrs. Hudson moment to date. <laughs> Just her screaming. <laughs> Just her, her, her well, seeing mean, that. Yeah. I, I, I think I made a note about it, and I just said Mrs. Hudson's cry at yeah. the mess. <laughs> I mean, you, you got it, because it's like without words, you just get the feeling that she organized I, every single one of those papers I at some point. I have to clean this up. Yeah, and now she's yeah. got to do it again, so it's a good moment. Um. I already said it, but, you know, one more nod to just every bit of post-production in this episode. You know, the pacing, the editing, it's just so well assembled. Again, you start to notice that when you do watch these things five times in a row, like very few people do, but we do. And it just really shines through as yeah. you see it as a whole and you, you see it flow. I, I, I just, Again, you know, kind of like what you said about Young Sherlock. Like, I think if you watched anything from this time on TV especially, and then you watch this... It's amazing, but I think it's also amazing that it still holds up. Right. One of my other favorite lines from this, and I'll try to do the accent, only if someone squeals. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wrote down S-K-W-E-E-W-E-W-S. -E 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 squeals. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know what accent that is. Some Cockney accent or uh, yeah. South London? I don't know. We could guess, but we just end up we looking like know. Americans. Yeah. Well, we are. Well, as we come to the end of the good, I, I actually had a note, which we already talked about, which is the end credit scene. 
and and there is a little moment there that I'll I'll call out, which is Jeremy Brett laughing at himself playing badly. <laughs> Oh, I didn't notice that. <laughs> he's playing and he's doing the dun 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 or, yeah. dun or whatever he's doing. And then there's a moment where he just stops playing and goes, ha! Oh, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't know if he was laughing at himself playing badly or laughing at Watson and the title. I'm not sure. Yeah, like like he was making messed up and he's like, I'll yeah, start that again. Yeah. yeah, but it was such a great little moment. But here's something I want to mention before we move on to the bad category. I'm sure you've noticed it. Probably every human who's watched these on HD has noticed it. But there's something that's really obvious at the end of this episode, which is the difference between HD and non-HD moments, Yeah, which happens in this example because when they mastered these episodes with those titles, that stuff was like burned in for broadcast. So when they went back to remaster these for Blu-ray or for wherever they're showing now in HD, there is no element that exists or at least they're not willing to do the work to recreate the title. Well, see that that's yeah, I think about that all the time and and I don't know the answer to that because I know I I've heard on other shows and even movies when you know early CG they yeah. did have to like in air quotes burn things in. Oh yeah. Yeah. And like or they painted on the frame. Right. And and they were scanned in that way and sometimes they were lost. I don't know why they couldn't have just rescanned the film and then just had somebody redo the titles. Well, right, but I think that's that's the answer right there. Is that would have been work and money? And... Well, I don't know, if, but that's what I mean. I wonder if it would be just work, or if if they were just missing, if the elements were missing. Yeah, it's possible. But I just I just wanted to kind of explain yeah. to people if if anyone even notices, like that's why. I mean, there's so many examples of it. Anytime Should... there's an effect, too. right? So like if there's a cross dissolve, I, like in the speckled band, when Helen Stone is telling her story, there's a there's a part of it where they they're doing this cross dissolve that just hangs. Yeah. So you're seeing two images at the same time. It's the same thing. It's just burned in. Right. But it's so noticeable here because there's those shots in between. Anytime there's he's writing in the book, we're seeing the credits from the episode. And then when we cut to his face and there's no credits, yeah. it's a pristine shot. Right. And then, you know, but if we cut back to his face and there's a credit, it gets blurry. Yeah. So it's just, I thought I'd bring it up and in case anyone was curious about why that would happen if it's not totally obvious. There, there's so many examples of this. I mean, shows like Babylon 5 and... Um, the Twilight Zone from the 80s. There's are right. shows where like there's no good copy of them out but there. Because... You know what they did on the Twilight Zone though is like they did they did dissolve to the good footage. Yeah. Sometimes like if if it wasn't the whole shot with an effect, right. They did have that those elements. True. It, it always depends on what the elements are and how they exist. I mean, it'd be so great. I mean, again, I, it costs money to change it. So like Star Trek the both the original series and the next generation they basically recreated the special effects right so they could go back to the film elements make the film elements great and then still have the special effects be great because they wouldn't be the special effects would be low quality and the film would be great quality because it just doesn't exist in good quality right so they had the budget to make it better and it'd be so great if every show had that budget but you know another example of that is uh well just that the elements are separate is the X-Files. Mm. When they put the X-Files on Blu-ray, they were forced to go back and recreate um, all the credits, right. which they did do, and it looks really nice, but for some reason, whoever owned the copyright to the font of the title, mm-hmm. the X-Files, yeah. wanted like a gazillion dollars, oh, really? and they just said no. So on the Blu-ray of that, it's different than it ever was in the show, mm-hmm. and it was a very distinctive yeah. like logo font right so like it looks totally different now <laughs> yeah um but it's just one of those things I yeah mean, one thing about fonts and titles though um if you haven't seen and i haven't watched all of it yet the new mark gatiss dracula show he is using the font from the jeremy brett sherlock holmes yeah but just a n- nice little touch i thought yeah interesting well Let's get into the bad. I don't think there is anything bad, but I did make one or two notes, and they're just really critical. Percy Trevelyan, he's not bad. He's fantastic in this episode. Nicholas Clay, I mean, we didn't spend too much time talking about him, but he's 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 interesting. He's different. But I guess that was kind of my bad, was that he's not like the book at all, frankly. Yeah. I mean, in the book, he's very, I don't know, but he's Meek. not... He's meek, yeah. He's not this. Nicholas Clay comes across as exceptionally self-assured, 
yeah. and confident and strong, well you know, all those things. Yeah. And yeah, and it's just different than the book, which it doesn't fail. It doesn't not work. It's just different than the book. So, I mean, again, if I'm scraping the bottom for bad, I, I put that there. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you had to dig into that a little bit, I mean, the fact that he is so smart and confident and, and knowledgeable and that he kind of doesn't put anything together about this mystery, yeah. you know, like, and then even at the end, he's lost. He's right. like, none, none of this makes sense to me. You yeah. Know, like, <laughs> it's a little bit weird, but it, it's not that weird. Yeah. He's also just, he's a very unique actor and I like him a lot. You know, I, I think he's very magnetic and he's, you, you really appreciate him in the voiceover moments, mm-hmm. you know, where, where we're not seeing him, but we're hearing him and he's saying things like, he came to live with me. Right. In the character of. Very articulate. A resident patient. Yeah. You know, and it's just, yeah, he's like, he, you can see him narrating books. <laughs> right, right. If you listen to the Stephen Fry narration of this story, yeah, he is much more meek. Yeah. You know, like Stephen reads him like, you know, he came to live with yeah, me as the yeah. resident patient. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, not really a bad. Not and, really bad. If we, I mean, it's not even worth saying, so maybe we don't say it, but th- there's like one shot that for half a second is bad. Which one? When um, Blessington sees himself in the coffin, the very, very beginning. Yeah. And he, like, backs up. Yeah, he kind of leaves frame. He kind of leaves frame for a second. I always wondered if that was... Intentional? Stylistic or not, you know? Well, it's just... I felt like they had blocked the shot. Mm -hmm. And then maybe he actually tripped a little more than he needed to because he catches him going up the stairs. It's a great opening, though. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love the moment. I, I love... You know, it took... Many years went by before I even realized... That that was the three of them standing covering their faces. Yeah, you know, and and it's so it's so. It was, and and also you you hardly ever see the other guy. Yeah, and he's the guy at the front. Yeah, and exactly. Like, his face is right in your in your face. And yeah, it, I didn't notice that for a while. Again, it's like a good song. It's like it it opens itself up more and more mm-hmm. the more times you watch it, and so it's well. Just, and, and like I said, when you see the coffin lining, yeah, and there's coins all around them. Yeah, you know, I love that. It yeah. all just it, it it's great. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the best Jeremy bits. I feel like we've probably said a lot of them, but um, what's your first one? Well, the, the one that comes to mind, um, and I think it's just great, especially the way it's written, it just says, Sherlock whistles. Yeah, that was my first note, too. <laughs> when it when it says that he hanged himself last night, and he goes, Whoosh! Yeah. It's just brilliant. Yeah, I'm just so glad they put it in, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it was just like a great choice of whistle. Even, yeah. Because he could have gone, Whoosh! You know, yeah, it could like, have been any. It could have been right. comical. <laughs> it was more like, wow. Yeah, and the description in the story is not descript, so yeah, it leaves it open for a person to go, "What in the world would Sherlock Holmes whistle in that moment?" <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly what he would whistle. Yeah, so it's it's great. I put uh, when Holmes lowers the body, the way mm-hmm. he grabs it and kind of like preps himself for grabbing it. Yeah, and then he grabs it, yeah, and it then takes we're just breath. yeah, we're just on his face as he brings it down. But it's like there's it's just, there's no there's no words to describe his performance in that moment. It's like it's morbid, but it's also got a job to do. Yeah, and it's also like he's using this moment to gain more evidence, almost mm-hmm. like I want to know how heavy this body is, what it feels like when I take it down off the rope. Like you know, somebody's got to do this, so I'm doing it. Like, there's just so much going through his face in that moment. And it's it's not nothing, you know what I mean? It's it's a yeah. it's a real performance of yeah. a moment that is probably on the script. It says something like Holmes brings the body down, right? Yeah, and he turns it into a whole scene where you could just watch that and really get something from his face. So it's it's really great. Yeah, and I mean the the whole scene where, when he's walking around the room, I think we could talk about. But like one of my favorite moments is just it's just so subtle. But when when he's surprised that everyone isn't on the same page, yeah, and he just goes. <laughs> Oh, it's <laughs> yeah. just that one word. It's Can't like, you tell us something now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a bunch of kids. Yeah, yeah. But he's just like, oh, I know. I thought everybody could see where I was going with this. Yeah, just yeah. Like, I love that. I don't suppose you've read my monograph on cigars and cigar ashes. <laughs> uh, well, uh, no, of course you haven't. Yeah. I like how serious he is when he just says, "This is Havana, but the one cigar." They're wrapped in straw, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They're longer for their length than other yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, my next note is just his whole Rafifi moment. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, that's just, I mean, top five moments of the entire series is that sequence, I think. I like when he puts his fingers in his waistcoat and then starts sidestepping out of shot. Yeah. You know, just, just 
again, just being like a little spindly spider yeah. about the room. Backing up a little bit, I love the moment when he looks at Blessington when, you know, he, he comes to visit him and he's standing at the top of the stairs and he's like, why do these men wish to molest you? And he's like, you hardly expect me to know that. And he's like, you mean you don't know? Yeah. And he's just like, he's like seeing through his deceit mm-hmm. with such, you know, omnipotence. And it's just like Jeremy Brett's face. I, I, God, he's just so good. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, how about the concerto fingering at the barber shop? Yeah. <laughs> bah, 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 bah. <laughs> just another, just another moment, you know. Yeah. I'm, you know, not written in the story, but it's one of those things I look forward to in this episode. And, and again, why, like, what I said about the Norwood Builder, it's like, I always think this one's coming next. Yeah. And then I get to have all these moments. Yeah. And again, that sequence, not in the story. So basically the beginning sequences and the end sequence, not in the story. The rest of it is very, very, very close to the book. Yeah. But but that sequence, just brilliantly written, brilliantly acted, just, just feels like it belongs right there. It doesn't feel fake, doesn't feel like it's not Conan Doyle. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, hats off to everybody. It's it really great. He was clutching his newspaper. It was torn to shreds. Torn to shreds. To shreds, you say? Yeah. Just so serious. All right, well, let's get to the vote. Persian slippers. I mean, I already said it. I'm giving it 10. I guess I I, I, I'm, I was almost slightly hesitating for a moment. I was thinking maybe I'd give it like 9.99999. But truthfully, maybe it's not. I mean, Solitary Cyclist is basically the best episode in my view, you know, yeah. it's, uh, is this one exactly as perfect as Solitary Cyclist mm. in every possible way? Maybe, maybe not exactly quite, but to me, they're different episodes. They feel different. They evoke different things in me. And I think they're both top, top notch yeah. in different ways. So yeah, I'm, I'm just giving it a clean 10. I think I gave Solitary Cyclist a 10. You did. I did. Okay. Then I would, uh, just to be different, I would say... You know, we're dealing in Persian slippers with hold tobacco, so let's say a little bit fell out and Holmes had to slide it off the chest of drawers with his little pinky finger. So I'd give it a 9.9. 9. <laughs> All right. I've recorded your vote. Well, before we get into some listener telegrams, we just want to take a quick moment to thank everybody for writing in uh, with support and uh, nice notes about uh, our film premiere in Boston. We had a good time. It was a uh, huge success for us we had an adventure we got to take a side trip to providence rhode island and visit the uh the stomping grounds of hp lovecraft and edgar Allan poe and freeze our feet off in the boston february winter weather which we are certainly not used to coming from the west coast yeah but um it was a good time definitely all right well let's look at some emails friend of the show mary writes in to say Hi guys, delighted to wake up to a new episode this morning, although once again I think I liked The Greek Interpreter a bit more than both of you, and the final line about it not being a crime to have a shred of compassion and a cold heart is one I've often thought of myself in real life when confronted with callousness and injustice. I also loved The 7% Solution, the book and the film even more, and the train scene is wonderfully reminiscent of its climax as well as contains the peerless Charles Gray. That that quote reminds me of a Richard Dawkins quote, which is, ignorance is no crime. Right. It's good. What, what did we give the Greek interpreter? Because I, I thought we rated that pretty good, because I had liked that episode. Yeah, I gave it a 9.4, you gave it a 9.9. That's pretty dang good. Come on. It is good. Mary goes on to say, regarding the resident patient, Nicholas Clay is high on my list of obscure British actors I have a crush on as well as appearing as the doctor in The Resident Patient and as Lancelot in Excalibur and many other romantic roles, he had another small but memorable turn as the doctor asked to assist in the disposal of Basil Halward's body in the picture of Dorian Gray. Halward was played by none other than Jeremy Brett. It also stars Peter Firth and John Gielgud and is well worth a watch. And uh, she provides a link to the YouTube where you can find and watch the entire two-hour film uh which is it's out there and it's pretty easy to find there's a couple of them out there you can find but uh yeah thanks mary that's a fantastic recommendation i actually did go ahead and um and watch that and i can highly highly recommend it it's it's quite good it was one of the bbc 
play of the month or something like that. I think it was from, I, I want to say 79. I'm not sure. Maybe it was 76. I'm not sure. But it, uh, yeah, Jeremy Brett at his best. Um, some really good performances there. Really good play. He was also in uh, the TV movie, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Yeah. Which um, I watched, and I, I, I don't remember like thinking it was more amazing than any other version of this, but mm -hmm. it had Brian Blessed in it, which was kind of fun. Yeah. But yeah, that's another one worth checking out. Yeah. Mary also commented on the Guardian obituary of Nicholas Clay, and she wrote, I particularly liked the quote, he could swash a buckle. Who could ask more than to be remembered thus? Yeah, that Guardian obituary was actually written by none other than Clive Marison. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I encourage fans of Mr. Clay and Mr. Marison to seek that out. It's a worthwhile read. Dominic writes in to say, Hi guys. I've been a massive fan of the Jeremy Brett shows and the original stories since I was a kid, and remain so now as a 41-year-old. I was lucky enough to see Jeremy Brett and Edward Hardwick at the Wyndham Theater, my dad's treat in reward of me winning a BBC quiz show called The Movie Game in 1989. Although it's a long time ago now, I can still remember the incredible performances and the minimal but effective set design. Thanks again for reconnecting me with a childhood favorite. I look forward to the next episode being put up. All the best, Dominic. Thanks, Dominic. I'm yeah, always man. jealous of people who got to see that play live. I'm surprised how many people have written in saying they've seen it. I know. <laughs> I feel like we're the only ones who haven't. Yeah. I'm also jealous of people who win quiz shows. That's got to <laughs> be pretty cool. Longtime friend of the show, Rob, wrote in. He says, Luke and Gus... I've always heard fans of Jeremy Brett referred to as Brettheads. I'm pretty sure Zach Dundas uses it in his great book, The Great Detective, but I could be getting it mixed up with another book. And since you're fans of limericks, I thought I would pass this on. The crew of the Bark Lone Star, the Dallas Sherlockian Society, recently put out their own collection of Sherlockian limericks. I don't think it's available for purchase, but it's available as a PDF. And uh, he put a link, but it's, it's pretty easy to find if you just go look up the canon, five lines at a time. There's there's a number of, I looked at it, there's a number of limericks for each story, and then there's a collection for each character, and uh, it's fun. There's some good ones in there, and there's some not-so-good ones in there. <laughs> I grabbed one just to read one um, for the resident patient. This one is written by someone named Kozin, and it goes, To practice, Trevelyan needed money. Blessington made a deal, a real honey. When his partner's in crime caught up with him in time he learned hanging around wasn't funny <laughs> <laughs> but we laughed yeah and he says uh, once again thank you for the great show it's always a pleasure to see a new one pop up on my phone rob thanks rob hey rob this next one is from Stuart in uh, peeblesshire scotland and uh, it came in a while ago but we're still playing catch up on emails so Stuart writes hi luke and gus I wanted to say thank you for your podcast. The Granada Sherlock Holmes series has entertained me all my adult life, and it's a great thrill to hear the episodes dissected in such a skilled and humorous way. Delighted that the Norwood Builder is up next. Not only do we get to meet Inspector Lestrade, but it also features Matthew Solon as John Hector McFarlane. Your researches will no doubt confirm that he is no longer an actor, but is now a management consultant. I was fortunate enough to attend one of his presentation masterclasses earlier this year through my employers. From the moment he entered the room, I knew I recognized him, but couldn't place him. Later, during introductions, he confirmed that he was an actor and had played along with, among others, Jeremy Brett, and it was then clear to me who he was. Happy to confirm that he is at the top of his game in his new profession, and we all learned a lot from him. Thank you again for your podcast. Can't wait to hear your future episodes. Best, Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, that's really cool. Mm. Um, I'd take a class from John Hatcher <laughs> McFarlane. <laughs> the unhappy John Hatcher McFarlane? Yeah, who didn't get a credit at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> yeah, that's why he was unhappy. Yeah. But uh, no, I'm glad he's doing good. Yeah. Frank writes in to say, Hi, I've been a fan of the Jeremy Brett series since they came out. Over the course of the years, I was also fascinated in the details of life in the late Victorian, early Edwardian era when they take place, and have researched a great deal of those details, from the propelling pencils to the style of clothing. In the Naval Treaty, an interesting habit comes up which is in the actual stories more than the series, but occurs in this particular episode, namely, 
the habit of taking a note on one's cuff. It was common to use paper cuffs in that era. They were cheap and saved on washing and the onerous task of starching and ironing. Since they were disposable after a few uses, they were thrown away. Hence, taking a note on the cuff was not uncommon. I look forward to the future episodes. So great to encounter fellow fans of the best and most faithful Sherlock Holmes, Frank. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's an interesting note because I, I did wonder about that. And I also did wonder about how often people washed their clothes back then. I'm actually curious if Jeremy Brett's cuffs in that episode were paper though <laughs> yeah or if he just decided to write on his like we're just gonna do it yeah because I, I can't remember in the story i don't think it says paper i could be wrong i'm not totally sure i don't remember it being in there it is is it yeah it takes it says he takes a note on his cuff oh, okay well yeah. then but i don't think it i don't think it specifies which kind but hmm. probably he was a gentleman he had some money he probably didn't care if he was writing on his yeah. non-disposable cuff or not it was pencil yeah it comes out Steve writes in to say, Hi, Luke and Gus, or is it Gus and Luke? As a massive Holmes fan, especially Brett, I couldn't have wished for a better subject matter. Being in my early 40s, I watched Brett growing up, and for me, he was always the best Holmes. But my love for the great detective goes beyond that, so I hope you'll cover the missing stories after the Granada material has been exhausted. I've become a supporter on Patreon, hoping you continue for a long time. Well, first of all, thank you, Steve, for supporting us on Patreon. Definitely. That's sincerely appreciated. And um, that's a good point. We've talked about whether or not we'll do something with the later stories after the podcast is over. I think it'd be great if maybe by then we're even better friends with Stephen Fry and maybe we could <laughs> go over them with him. Yeah. Because he could just read them and then we could <laughs> discuss. Well, maybe by then there'll be a 4K version of the box set and we have to start over. That's true. We'll see what happens. But, you know, it, it, speaking of that a little bit, I mean, um, speaking of Patreon too, we, we, we have been doing these like book reports for, for people who don't know. Gus tends to buy all these different Sherlock Holmes books and we, we do like a short little review about, you know, what you're getting. So if, if yeah. that's something you're interested, they're on Patreon. Yeah, most of those up to this point are related to the show, but... Um, yeah, like the yeah, background on the yeah. show. Yeah, people wouldn't believe how many books I have on this show, so there's quite a few more to come, so we'll, yeah. get, we'll get to those. But Steve went on to say, I've delayed writing this email as I only discovered the podcast recently via a random tweet from someone I follow and wanted to listen to all the episodes before contacting you. I was born and bred in Walsall, West Midlands, where Miss Violet Hunter from the Copper Beaches moved at the end of the story. Like others, I try to connect real world with the stories and wanted to see which private school Doyle was referring to. The one that springs to mind, and is the most well-known, not many private schools in Walsall, is Queen Mary's. It was founded in 1554, and I would like to think that this is the school in question. I've recently moved away from Walsall, and now live down the road from Berkswell, the birthplace of Jeremy Brett. When I moved into the area, I looked into buying his old house at Berkswell Grange, but apart from being a hefty price tag, it has been snapped up by the HS2, the new high-speed railway from Birmingham to London, so I'm not too sure of its fate. And then he puts a link to some images from the Grange from a previous listing, uh, which I'm sure pretty much anybody can find online if you you want to see what it looked like. Yeah, actually, we got a... Somebody tweeted at us uh, a couple months ago when we were in England from someone saying they were the gardener at his family home in Warwickshire. Mm. Um, and then it says, legend has it, uh, he once rode a horse in the, upstairs into the house, and it says, sadly, it is owned by HS2 now, so mm. who knows what the future is. But there is a picture of it on, on, oh, on, on our, our Twitter, Twitter feed as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, yeah, have a look. and From and October 15th, if you want to go looking for it. Yeah. These high-speed rail people have no respect for... Uh, they could just put a bump in and just go over it. Yeah, just leave that one there. Well, that's sad if it's going to go away, but um, at least there's pictures online, I guess. Let's read just one more, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, John wrote in to say, Hello, Luke and Gus. I changed it up. I was watching a recent interview with Tom Baker, posted January 20th, 2020, where Baker was asked if he ever met any of his heroes. Baker said he had not, but then he mentioned Jeremy Brett. Well, I remember meeting... Jeremy Brett, yes, and him being very nice to me. I greatly admired him because he and I had played Sherlock Holmes. I only played him. Jeremy, of course, was an amazing creature. He turned into Sherlock Holmes. Oh, 
Yes, he was wonderful. Who are your heroes that you haven't met? Ah, uh, I don't know you well enough to admit that. No. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting uh, adaptation. The Hound of the Baskervilles with Tom Baker it was actually written by Alexander Barron, who also penned the pilot of the Granada series, Scandal in Bohemia. Wow. Yeah, so he had some uh, Sherlockian cred when he came to that one. <laughs> That was a great episode. It was a great one, just not the best one. (laughs) Um, John goes on to say, At any rate, it was a nice surprise to hear Baker mention Jeremy Brett and to learn of his admiration for him. I knew I had to share it with the both of you. Looking forward to the next podcast, John. Yeah, thanks, John. That was a great little bit. I'm so glad you sent it in, and I'm glad now everyone else has got to enjoy it as well. It is always interesting getting these emails because we started this podcast you know over a year ago now i said on twitter and uh when we first started it we like we didn't tell anybody that we were even doing it for like three months Mm -hmm. just because it was an experiment in terror Mm -hmm. and now you know but it's fun to hear from fellow bretons brediacs bredards (laughs) sherlockians sherlockians people correcting our pronunciation yeah so yeah thanks for writing in Okay, well, thank you all once again for listening to the show. We are out there on the internet at twitter.com slash SherlockPod if you would like to follow us. And please do drop us a line if you'd like to share your own thoughts and reminiscences about the Granada series. We always enjoy reading them. You can reach us at contact at SherlockPodcast.com. And if you like the podcast, please like and subscribe on iTunes. A special thanks to all of our Patreon subscribers. Your support helps us keep this show going, more than you can know. And we continue to add bonus content to our Patreon page for subscribers, including a recent video review of the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective board game, which we both really liked. So do join us there if you like, at patreon.com slash sherlockpodcast. Well, the next episode requires no hype on our behalf, We'll see you next time for the classic, The Red-Headed League. Until then. <laughs> <laughs>